All right, the recording is on. Oh, wonderful. This this is Book Club, uh, January 11th, 2020. Wonderful. So um, I see Arthur and Melanie here. They're going to be leading our discussion of chapters three and four in the James Yunker book, uh, The Idea of World Government from Ancient Times to the 21st Century. I heard someone else come in, did I, or? I think Ron and Glossop <laughs> might be. Oh, Ron is Dave here. Erica. Ron Dave is Dave on. Okay, and we have Donna and Bob and Terry and Tom Hastings and Beth Blick and myself already. And Pardon? James. James. Oh. Did you mention James? No, I didn't. Jane is here. Is, by phone? No, James. James? Is that your name, James? Well, I go by Terry. Terry Gates. Oh, uh, right. Terry. Oh, Terry. James is my name. This is Ron, Ron Glossop on the phone. I'm right. going to change your name to Terry. Okay. <laughs> and, and Terry is a <laughs> on the screen. The St. Louis group. Oh, with, how do you spell it? With a Y? With no, an I? How do you spell it? With a Y. T-E-R-R-Y. So, and, and Ron Glossop just joined us. Ron Glossop just joined. That's right. Next month, Ron and Dave Otten and Terry will be leading discussion on the last two chapters of the book, chapters. Well, three. Ron, uh, Dave Otten and Ron will. Oh. Yeah. Dave will, Dave will do chapter five, Ron will do chapter six. Oh, okay. Um, did I hear someone else join? I'm here. Yes, right here. Evan, Evan and Lee. Evan and Lee have joined oh, since you've oh. been. Hi, with me. Okay. Oh, yay. Hello. Well, we're all here, so we may as well get Oh, good. Um, Arthur and Melanie, take it away. Yeah. Arthur's first. Okay. Well, um, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, we, uh, we really are enjoying the, the book club. Let me get on to my, uh, here we go. Uh, and uh, Chancellor, and the dog. We, we can't begin to compete with Bob Flax. Bob Pla Flax is the, the master. He did a fantastic <laughs> job. And uh, so we won't even, even try to compete with that. But we're really, really, really good to be with you all this morning and uh, uh, to very, very much appreciate all the, uh, all the dedication. And I guess my first question is, uh, uh, so how, how many of you have, have you all read the book already? Yeah. Yes. No. Yes. Is there anybody on the call who didn't read the book? I no, I haven't heard of it yet. Uh, who was that? That's Beth. I Beth. Pat. Pat. Okay, so Pat, you who ha you haven't gotten a chance to read it. Yeah. Uh, well, then there will be a little yeah, I bit. I think of, we could uh, always summarize. Yeah, I think we could always count on the fact. I didn't hear that. What was that? Yeah, I, I was saying I think we could always count on the fact that some people will have read it and some people will not have. We could okay. always count on that. Yeah, let's just. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, I guess first, before, before we, we're, what we're going to do is uh, uh, Melanie and I, Melanie's going to summarize, uh, uh, you know, her chapter and I'm going to summarize, uh, she's going to chat and I'm going to summarize the, the, uh, the post-war period chapter. And then uh, we're going to, uh, uh, but we're also going to have a few general questions. So before we do that, uh, there are a couple of questions that I'd like to ask. And one is, uh, uh, did people find the book enlightening? Uh, what did they learn from it? Ron Glossop has a comment. Yes, Ron. Go, Ron. I believe that Yunker does a very good job of summarizing what has happened. I think the one thing we need to be aware of is his own viewpoint, which comes through mainly in the way that he words things. He is a world federalist. There's no doubt about it. But he has this notion that world federalism is not getting the kind of support that it needs because it keeps talking about a type of world government 
which is a one world government, one totalitarian regime that takes control of everything. And he himself has an alternative idea that we ought to start with a confederation not much different from the United Nations. And so he keeps talking about this. But the main thing that he says that world federalists pay, need to pay attention to, Juncker says there's something the world federalists have not paid enough, enough attention to, and that's the economics of the global situation. You've got to remember, Juncker is an economist, a professor of economics. And his viewpoint is very much influenced by the awareness of the vast disparity between the poor countries and the rich countries. And he, in addition to being a world federalist, also has proposed a global Marshall Plan, which I think is a very good idea and something that world federalists need to pay attention to that you've got to have more economic equality before you're going to be able to get a world government that has very much influence. Because at the present time, the rich countries want a world government that they will control, and the poor countries want a world government that they will control. And if you have a democratic world government, <laughs> If it's set up according to population, the poorer countries are going to rule. Uh, on okay. page Bob Stack. Yes. Donna oh. Stack. I think Donna had her hand up first, so did Gail. So go to them first. Oh, okay. <laughs> Who's facilitating, by okay. the way? Is it, is it author or is it Gail, just so that we're clear? Uh, who's, who's choosing Donna speakers? Facilitate. Yeah. Uh, Gail, are you, are you choosing speakers or am I choosing them? Oh, I thought you were, Arthur. Okay, oh, do you want to do that, Melanie? Uh, yes, Donna, please go. Okay. Um, so, um, I, I, there were two things that I, I are stirring in my heart. One is the things um, Ron mentioned, and I'm sorry I blurted it out, that um, he, uh, Juncker keeps using the phrase omnipotent world state, and it drives me crazy because it sounds as if all the power is in one place, and that is not, we're only talking about power to deal with global issues in one place. And every time he says it, I, I just, I, I underline it and say no. Um, and then the other thing that I, I really object to is the idea that we only include democracies. I feel like our whole goal is to get people to consider themselves world citizens and eliminate the us versus them. And once you start including us versus them, it's, it's, I just don't see how it's really going to solve the problems that the world is facing. Yeah, I so thought that's a very things. good point, Don. I just would like to uh, emphasize that. I also very much agree that his, uh, uh, it, the amount of time he spent on the proposal for a, 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 a unity of the, of the democracies, uh, you know, what really even is, is democracy and the idea that one system is superior to the other, in many cases, <laughs> we see that it breaks down. And so uh, I think you're absolutely right that a system that sets up in the very center of it, uh, us versus them, is doomed to failure. Good point. Uh, who else would wanted to break in before we uh, who is move before on? Bob? To... Who is before Bob? I think Gail had her hand up, too. I don't know how to put a hand up. Yeah, just to, uh, uh, well, just say your to... name and just say like Bob Stack that you want to be in the stack, oh, and then we'll I'll... know to put you Very in. Good. Okay, so and I'll make a list. So yeah, there is a, there is a cat. If you click on participants, there is a place where you then click under participants on raise hands, and as long as uh, Melanie's well, we, kind of watching, we that. usually just wave our hands. Those of us on the screen well, wave okay. our hands. <laughs> right, let's do the wave of hands because it's a small enough group. We don't need to use that. Button. Right, okay, right, wave your right. Hand, I'll check you. <laughs> people on the phone, people on the phone can't raise their hands. So I think um, Bob's way is. So everyone just shout out. Once you ask a question, everyone shout out their name, and I'll write them down, and then I'll call you in order. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. All right. So I think did we decide Bob was next, or did we decide G Gail? Then I'll go. Okay, Gail. Then Bob. All right. I was struck by his um, talking about the fee. Lost. You're frozen, Gail. You're frozen, Gail. Gail, you're frozen. We can't hear you. 
I hope you come yeah, back. Yeah, you're frozen. Okay. So well, let's come back Bob. to Gail and go to Bob because Gail, your bandwidth is bad. If you can get closer to your modem, it might be good. Uh, Bob, you want to go? Okay. For, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, two or three quick points. One is I, Donna made my first one that, um, you know, a moment ago, Ron said he used the word totalitar totalitarian. And actually, Juncker uses the phrase that Donna said, an omnipotent world state, that, that he, um, you know, he's afraid that the traditional world federalist proposals, uh, which he gives three of them, uh, all are these, quote, omnipotent world states, and that won't fly. You know, he feels that will not be accepted uh, by the whatever, the people, the, the nations, whatever. So he comes at it this other way, which is more kind of easing into it, putting a toe in the water, and then we go for five years, and then it seems to be working, that we, we, we go a little deeper into the water, and so on. So he has this wading into it, rather than, you know, yeah, drafting a constitution, and the whole thing gets up and running at once. If you're, um, uh, uh, please mute your phone, by the way, we do hear some background noise. So that's point one. Point two, I think it's worth a discussion, uh, maybe at the end of the, the, you know, this book or another book, of whether or not all the states or the nations in it need to be democracies. Uh, Donna raised that, and that's, I think that's an important issue to discuss. Because uh, for personally, I'm not aware of any world federalist proposals where the nations are not democracies, where dictatorships come in and all that. Because the, one of the arguments, of course, if the dictator has all the people in their nation vote a certain way, you know, on world things, that's not a global democracy, you know? Right. And also if the, um, what was I gonna say? And, and, and no, di if I was a dictator, that I would not want my people to be voting on the world level because then they have it in their in their mind they can vote on the national level and get rid of me. Yeah. You know. So uh, so I think that would be the main impediment that you know that they might be allowed in, but a dictator wouldn't want to do it. You know. So I mean, it would be very and and that's only one or two of the more obvious reasons. So I'm not suggesting we, we go there now, but I wanted to plant the flag, say that issue of whether a world government is democratic or not. Because one of the, um, that's the last point I'll make on it is one of the main ideas, if it is democratic, then, or, you know, or only democracies, then the dictatorships, when they see the benefits in those democracies, you know, what they're getting, they'll go, oh, we're gonna get rid of our dictator. You know, and and, mm -hmm. and and overturn them so that they can join. Mm -hmm. So it's an incentive uh, to get rid of dictatorship. So it's a way longer discussion. I just wanted to flag it because I think it's an. Yeah. Okay, before I we think, go to Gail, I'd good like good. to interject. I'd like to interject. So anybody who, before you speak, just unmute, just like Bob said, because that way we can folks stay on the speaker instead of going to different places. So like. For example, Gail, well, Gail's going to speak, but um, for example, like Dave, if he there, he just did that, I think. I don't know. But right now we see Dave. So I don't know if the phones can mute themselves. Yeah, they can mute themselves. Yeah. So, you have to know how. Yeah. yeah, you just press the button mute on your on your phone. And uh, that way we'll have just focusing on the, the speaker who's speaking. And then you unmute each time. Now we're going to Gail, please. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh. Yes. Well, I was struck by his uh, saying in a number of places that the, uh, you know, there is a, a danger that the poor countries of the world, are, which, which are more populous, would, if there were a democracy, um, essentially um, ransack the rich countries. And um, I hadn't been aware of that as a fear that uh, the rich had had. And he said that that was also true within the U.S., in U.S. history, in the way that the U.S., government was was established but historically that has not happened i don't think uh that historically it's been more the case that the rich countries have plundered the poor countries exactly. so i just wanted to to make that uh observation and then uh as to bob's point about democracies the question is what is a democracy because according to the last report the u.s is not a democracy it's an oligarchy 
And I personally think that the, the division, the, the um, power differences, well, economic differences translate into power differences because money can buy power. That's the central most problem, the greatest problem the world has today. Because if we can't, uh, can't deal with that, no matter what system we have, it's going to be corrupted. So I just made, wanted to make those observations. I think that's an extremely good point, uh, Gail, and I, I really appreciate it. And I think that uh, I think that the key in what Bob said was that if you structure the participation to include uh, a key component for the populace having a direct say, then uh, a dictatorship might refuse to join because it didn't want its people to have a say, but there would be a lot of pressure too. And as we would, the, the, the organization wouldn't exclude dictators as long as they agreed to be a part of a thing where their people could vote at the world level, even if they can't locally. But if a dictator then didn't want to do that, that's fine. But they wouldn't be, they would self-exclude themselves. But uh, I think you're right then, Bob, that that would help create a pressure to build it. Uh, I want to just ask all people also, was there anything you found surprising in the book? Anything new and different? So many of you have been in the Federalist movement for years, and lots of what he said seemed to be, uh, you know, just going over things we've considered about. Was there anything surprising or new to anyone? Now remember, we're going to make a list, so just shout out your name. You haven't got through the other list first. Oh, oh, okay. Go ahead. Do you want to just say something about the previous question? Yes, go ahead, Terry. Well, uh, I think we're a lot of this discussion is getting ahead of chapter three and four. Yeah, it is. Out into five and six. Um, the way that the author puts the problem is on page 44. He lists three problems that um, the uh, attempts at world government from Versailles to the nuclear age possessed. One, it had no military forces under its direct control. Two, it possessed no authority to levy taxes. And three, it was separated from any direction, direct connection with the populations, which goes to the uh, democracy question. But I think those three defects set up his proposals in uh, chapter six, but in chapter three, he fleshes that out. Those three defects are fleshed out. He puts up the European Union, Union the first attempts at it, and, uh, and uh, says that uh, they were ahead of its time. But I think uh, it, 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 the surprise for me is in the clarity of his uh, view of the defects of their attempts at world government from Versailles to the nuclear aid. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that very much, Terry. That was uh, one of the things that jumped out at me as well, that I felt that was a good description of a defect. And uh, perhaps since you mentioned wanting to go a little more into the chapter, uh, Melanie does oh, yeah. have a brief outline of what's in the chapter. This might be a good time to I jump to her outline and then come back to some more general discussion. All right, so I'm gonna go share my screen. Here we go. There we are. I don't know. And while she's, okay, there we go. And so, yeah, I know. Here is the chapter three. Dun, da, dun, da, da. All right, so basically, just a real quick outline. So, Yunker said, Basically, at one point, he talked about how world, what, there were people who thought war was healthy. And once they, ha once they had World War I, of course, they realized how horrible it was. But still, it seems like people were not ready for a world government. Well, then it, along came the League of Nations, which in came, came into, uh, it was established in 1919, of course, ceased operations in 1946. That didn't stop World War II. Here, what was, this is um, what the League of Nations is made of, in case folks, just as a reminder. So all the members are represented in the assembly. There's a smaller, there was a smaller council. That was only the major powers. And then they're on the smaller nations on a rotating basis. So that, you know. And then of course, uh, there was a secretary general with the 
admin secretary, court of international justice, and lots of committees and subcommittees. And they met once a year for a one month at a time, which is wild. Now, the, uh, Juncker was saying that the fact that decisions need to be approved unanimously by all the members, that is considered to have been a fatal flaw as well. Just generalized, uh, generalized state, statement. Also, he mentions that, let's see if I can move this. He mentions uh, this, okay, they, uh, the citizens of the member nations didn't have a sense of being more than that. They were just still stuck in the nation uh, level. And um, also, the, they didn't consider it in their international relations. It wasn't really, it wasn't considered as a big force. The, of course, the big one is, another big one is the court didn't have enforcement. So the US was never a member. The US was never a member. And Russia joined late and then was expelled after they invaded Finland. So there was, you know, the big nations were, where they were dissatisfied. However, there were a few things it did do. It did intervene in like a border skirmish and the, uh, between Bulgaria and Greece. And that was nice, but it might've been because, Juncker says, might've been because the bigger nations weren't even interested, so they didn't care. So that could have been it. Then, of course, he mentions again, he's mentioned several times in the, in the book. Um, and so thank you for Terry for bringing, I was gonna say, thank you, Terry, for bringing that part up because I thought that was very, this whole thing was great. And so now he also did um, mention again, uh, Searchlight on Peace Plans, which was a, is a book uh, co-written by Edith Weiner and Georgia Lloyd, who is the daughter of Loyola Maverick Lloyd, who co-founded the Campaign for the World Government in 1937 with Roskia Schwimmer. Now, um, he, he agrees that there's probably, there were 25 plans in the book, of, you know, the Lloyd Schwimmer book. Um, that uh, starting from 1915 that were pretty much what we're talking about. And he really went on a lot to talk about Clarence Streit's plan, but, um, and his plan was membership was only available to democratic nations, uh, but it was never seriously considered. So then he went on to the horrors of World War II and the unprecedented destructive powers of nuclear weapons. So he went on about that. So that is, Chapter three in a nutshell. Thank you everyone for listening. Summary. Yeah. Yay. Yay. Now I'll get back to on screen and share. And I have to, I moved you guys. So let's see if I can do that. <laughs> All right. Okay. So now um, Arthur has another question. Um, okay. So, uh, so from, from, from what, from what Melanie <laughs> has said, uh, let's just start with what were the main differences between the League of Nations and the United Nations that people saw? And again, I'll make a list, just shout out your name. I'll make a list. Um, and, and, and did they, okay, so what lessons, okay, but let's just rephrase that. That didn't get an answer right from there, but, um, you know, how was the UN like the League of Nations? How are they different? And how did that give us some further implications for today's world and how we move forward? Any, any comments on that? Or any other just general comments on what Melanie said? <clears throat> yeah. Ron has a comment. Donna. Yeah. Donna, Donna Ron, then Donna. Ron, Donna. And who was the next person? Bob, Bob Stack. Bob, okay. All right, so Ron, you're first. Well, it seems to me that the biggest difference is that the UN includes the bigger countries like the United States and the Soviet Union, while the League of Nations did not. And so and the United States never did join the League of Nations. So I think that the biggest thing, the biggest difference was that the UN was trying to go from the very beginning as a unanimous institution for all the governments of the world. Mm -hmm. All right, then Donna, you're next. 
the point the the point um, that I wanted to make was in response to your question, Arthur, about I don't know what what needs to be worked on, and it's that um, the sense that it with the League of Nations there was no sense of being part of a bigger of the bigger world, and to to some extent that has been true up until now, really that people don't, especially in the U.S. A lot of people don't even like being part of the UN, but there certainly is a growing movement of global citizenship, a sense that we are all together. It's coming from the people, not from the bottom up, not from the top down. And I really feel like that is an important area to to work and push and grow, that the only way um, uh, that we're going to be able to move the world the way we want it to go is by by winning the hearts and minds of people that we're all world citizens, global citizens, whatever the word is, and and demand that our leaders do something. Now, Bob? Yeah, I, I, I want to um, actually kind of answer the, the, or speak to the reverse of the question, which I was really surprised because I didn't know, or I don't remember from school that much about the League of Nations, but Yonko made the point how structurally similar the League is to the UN. A different body, the assembly is like our <laughs> assembly, you know, different things that they, they had. A, I forgot what it was called, the body of the larger nations. So that's like our Security Council, that, that he was making the point how similar um, they were structurally. And that was an eye opener uh, for me. I, I didn't realize that. So that was my point. Thank you. Yes, and Bob, I, I agree with that. That was also, I thought, striking. And he also did mention one other big difference, which he said that. Uh, in addition to be having virtually universal membership, uh, that the UN made a far more systematic and determined attempt to eradicate the roots of warfare by fostering economic, political, and social progress throughout the world. And that's one of the things we often mm -hmm. like to talk about. I mean, on the one hand, we see the UN and the General Assembly and nations locked at, at loggerheads and not getting places and nothing. But also there's an incredible amount of things that are being done by the UN that are really encouraging uh, uh, economic and political and social progress throughout the world. And I think it's important to note that as well. Great, right. anyone else for that particular question or any other comments? Yeah, it's like a wake up call uh, on the other hand. Well, uh, also, also during this Terry, um, also during this period it was the growth of the multinational corporations. Um, this is uh, made possible, of course, by technology and might be ahead of where we are in the discussion. But uh, beginning it after World War II were uh, the seeds of international, non-national, multinational corporations. else? Well, Evan here. I mean, it seems to me it, it's uh, that the um, existence of the General Assembly of the UN, which operates by majority vote of countries, uh, uh, but nevertheless can take action without unan unanimity, uh, formal action, and document its decisions, publish them, and, and so on, and um, uh, stimulate the uh, um, international conferences to achieve um, um, consensus among countries is an important difference with the uh, League of Nations. Donna's back. All right. <clears throat> I, I just wanted to welcome Soveda Mani Ewing, who just joined mm -hmm. us, and let everyone know she's here, and to let Tom Hastings know that we cannot see anything except your fan, maybe ahead of one, but I don't know. I can't see much. Can anybody else see who's there in Tom's living room? No, you're but he's got like, a very nice fan. The ceiling fan is very You have nice. a very nice fan <laughs> and ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I did earlier, I muted you, Tom. Earlier I muted you, Tom, when there was some background noise, and then, but I took it off and we haven't heard any background noise, but just, just to let you know, there you were causing the background noise before. We want to <clears throat> welcome Barrett Parak also, who just joined us. Oh, no, oh, he, uh, hello, Barrett. Sorry, Barrett. That's fine. Thank you. I'm listening. 
Okay. Someone has to listen. <laughs> and we are on chapter three, Soveda, right now. Uh, Melanie just gave us the subject of chapter three. And we've been talking about the differences between the UN and the League of Nations. Thank you. Hey. And similarities. Differences yeah. and similarities. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's see, Arthur, you're, you're up. Uh, maybe, maybe this is a good time to uh, move a little bit more forward into the, uh, into the next chapter. And uh, I think I'll just share my screen of a few of the things that I've, uh, uh, that <laughs> I've uh, highlighted in the book uh, that uh, struck me as, as interesting. Um, one was that, of course, there was a big uh, world government boom. You can see my screen, everybody, right? Yeah. Not yet. Yeah, OK. Uh, no. OK, now we yeah. can. Now. Okay. But those on the phone, of course, can't see it. So you'll have no. to tell them what you're saying. Uh, I, I, you won't have to see it. But, um, you know, there, there was, of course, after the shock of Hiroshima and the incredible length of, of World War II and the great, incredible increased destructiveness, uh, there was uh, a, a huge reaction to that, which helped stimulate the big world government movement uh, right after the war. But he mentions that within a remarkably short space of time, most people had filed away the threat of dying in a world nuclear holocaust in the same compartment as the threat of dying in an automobile accident. And I thought that was a good parallel because the reality is, you know, we run around with great fears of you know, Ebola or all kinds of things, all kinds of fears run through our society. And actually, the biggest, <laughs> the biggest risk in our country in the U.S. of dying is an automobile accident, and it's far more likely than many other things, but yet we file it away because it's just a constant uh, threat. And the threat of nuclear war was so immense and had such an impact on me. I remember uh, you know, back during the, the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, that uh, I was living in Washington, D.C., and we were mobilized, you know, Friends were coming over who were being mobilized into the military and called up, and, and the teachers were set, telling us to, uh, you know, to, uh, to 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 hunter our desks and put our our, our head between our legs. And I refused. I said, you know, if there's a nuclear war, Washington D.C. is going to be a, you know be totally devastated. Being under our desks isn't going to help. And I got sent to the principal's office for that. But I said, you know, this is crazy. What we have to do is prevent uh, nuclear war. And somehow that 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 uh, fear of nuclear war uh, does stay with me because it's real. I mean, the bulletin of atomic scientists clock continues to get closer and closer. And yet, there's something strange about the the human psyche where both that and global warming, which are these huge huge threats, get filed away. You know that uh, uh, as he said, he says mentally healthy individuals don't waste time worrying about hazards that cannot be avoided. For the end of the world, if we can't avoid the end of the world. What can we avoid? So uh, I think that he points then to, I think, a very important book, uh, The Anatomy of Peace by Emery Reeves. Um, uh, I hope many of you, I know many of you have read that, and I know that's something that uh, had a huge impact on Gary, as you saw in our movie, when he read that, it suddenly gave him the, the fantastic aha that, oh my God, humanity actually has invented a system that eliminates war, and that you know, we've developed government systems where it's just unheard of that, you know, California would attack Nevada or anything like that. And uh, so, so this, the, the issues we're struggling with in, the, um, in these major, uh, uh, in these discussions with these books is really critical to the, to the future of, uh, of humanity itself. And he also uh, mentioned uh, that, uh, okay, so Reeves mentions that the, that the only way to stop once and for all the endless succession of devastating war is for the nations of the world to establish a strong, effective world government. And he dismisses the argument that it would soon be an oppressive totalitarian state by pointing out that the pressure associated with international anarchy is already forcing the great powers to become oppressive totalitarian super states. And I thought that was interesting. We don't tend to notice it, but incredible amount of oppression right in the U.S. We talk about being a democracy and so on, but in many ways, uh, with all these, you know, the Pentagon's total information awareness and, uh, you know, they've got tools of control that, uh, that, that the Nazis and the KGB never had. And um, so he says, if allowed to persist indefinitely, the national sovereignty system might well cause even the liberal democracies to, to become tyrannical dictators in the, in the image of Hitler's Nazi Germany and Stalin's Soviet Russia. Well, you know, I think it's sort of, again, like the, 
you know, the mouse thrown in the boiling water who, uh, or not the mouse, the, well, oh, you know, the uh, frog that, uh, you know, it's thrown in cool water and it just keeps getting hotter and hotter and doesn't mention, notice he's, he's reaching a boiling stage. But I mean, we're reaching a boiling stage with the current administration and with the, with the hate fed thing. So many parallels to what does lead to kind of Nazi Germany type thing. And I think that it's a real, uh, a real, real important to, 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 to recognize that we are da going down that slippery slope and that in fact, it's so funny, we say, you know, that, uh, uh, that the, the, real, the real fact is that it's not that, uh, it's not peace that causes, you know, the possibility of oppression, it's, it's, the, it's the lack of it. In other words, it's in, the, in, it's in a war state that people become totalitarian. Why, did, why was Nazi Germany able to get away with, with murdering all those people? Because they pulled out of the League of, League of Nations and they went into a, a war state. I mean, it was, it was uh, uh, Winston Churchill himself, <laughs> one of the key architects over the who said there never was a war easier to prevent by timely action and this war that's just devastated so much of humanity. And he goes on to talk about that he had really wanted the League of Nations to have peace and, 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 to, and to work. And if it had, we never, we never would have had the, 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 the tars that happened in, in World War II. And this is coming from Churchill himself. So it's not the world government that's the danger of totalitarianism, because when you get all the people into a government, people aren't going to accept anything totalitarian. It's only when there's an outside enemy that we say, oh my God, we've got to become totalitarian to fight this outside enemy. When we don't have an outside enemy, we'll naturally evolve more and more democratic methods and more and more ways of interacting. So I thought these were, were, were good points that, uh, that were written by Yarkers. Um, oh, Arthur, can I interrupt? Um, Donna, would you mind muting everybody except Arthur, briefly? Yeah, uh, let, let, let me let people comment on that oh, before well, I mind. go. Never mind. Let me uh, maybe unshare my screen a minute and see if people, or I can leave this, yeah, let's unshare the screen a moment. And uh, and before I go on to more of the book, and keep it more of a discussion, um, I don't want to just be dominating here with, with my talk. Let's see, how do I unshare? Let me go. Yeah, you have to go share. hover over, hover um, over, oh, share at the bottom. And then the stop share. Meeting controls. Here we go. Meeting controls. Stop One. Share. Where do I go? Do you want me to do uh, it? Oh, you got it. Yeah, unshare un un me. If you can. I can do it. Oh, I yeah, can do it. Uh, oh, good. Bob, Bob stack. But now, now I have to unshare. Oh, boy. Oh, I took okay. it from Bob. And okay. Did now I get I it from you? Share. Share. Okay, you cannot share screen with another person sharing. Okay, yeah, now you're sharing, so I can't. Uh, now, yeah, and now I can unshare. That's pretty funny. Wait There's a minute. No Sorry. I have the... lost my ability to see my screen. That's funny. Oh, yeah, can that's... somebody uh, take it back from me? Uh, <laughs> I don't know what's happened. I've lost my ability to see my whole screen. It is oh, wow. oh, I got it. I got oh, it. Perfect. Sorry. Oh, Bob's Sorry. back. It's right. harder than you think. Yeah. Let, let me have a little discussion on, on uh, any questions or comments on, on what I was just saying before I go back into uh, some of the highlights that, that, that uh, struck me in, in this chapter. And again, uh, any, everyone can say their name and I'll make a list. Terry. Terry, yeah. first. Uh, one sidebar item on, uh, on froze. <laughs> One sidebar item on peace. Um, there's a, a foundation in St. Louis area called the Lentz Foundation, who for years has commissioned studies on research on peace. Um, the study of, of peace situations systematically. Uh, that foundation um, is weakening now because uh, th that that, that uh, trend didn't continue, i.e. The, the scientific study, study of peace. Mm, interesting. Any, anyone else? Bob Stack. All right, yeah. Bob, go ahead. Yeah, two, two quick points. One is, is I want to underscore um, something that Arthur just said, because I, um, I recently kind of heard it myself, both from Juncker and some of you may know Chuck Woolery, and he is always making the same point. And, and basically the point is that, that you know, people think, some people think that if we um, have a world government and you know, let go of some of our sovereignty 
that we will use, we will lose human rights, that our human rights will evaporate. Okay. But, but Juncker here and Chuck is always arguing the point. No, no, no. You need a world government to protect human rights because the way it is now, if you have sovereign nations that are battling each other or even just paranoid and putting in more security measures and all the things like we're doing now with the NSA and all that, that's what erodes our human rights. Mm -hmm. that, that it's actually the condition of sovereignty that leads to the erosion of human rights and also leads to the erosion of general well-being because of all the money that has to go into military and armaments and all that stuff that as, as Ben Ferenz make, you know, makes his point in, in, in his book, Planethood, that there would be unbelievable prosperity that would be opened up once the money doesn't have to go to the war machine you know, and, and, and the security machine and all the rest. So, um, so it was really, in my mind, a, a reversal of, you know, of, of that criticism. So right. that's, that, that's one point. The second point I want to make, not, not on this, but I assume most people got, I sent Gail a, um, a char two charts uh, from one of Juncker's other books right. that goes over different models of world government that I assume Arthur will be getting to, uh, you know, to talk about. But I just want to make sure um, that people know that those charts are connected to this chapter. So um, I will get there, but I just wanted to say that if you got that in the mail, that they're from this chapter or related yeah. to this chapter. Thank you. I, I did send them. We, we did. Yeah, you want to say something? Oh, yeah, I did send them. Yes. Did, uh, yes. yes, everybody got those. And I think it would be great uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes to come back to Bob, since Bob sent those. I thought they were excellent. Uh, maybe, Bob, you'd want to put those up on your screen to share. Uh, since I don't have them already open on my screen, I don't want to shuffle around for them. Uh, after I ask this next question, maybe we can come back to you and we can go briefly over those that excellent chart you sent, if that's okay. Uh, and oh, yeah, well, I would have to go into my email and get them, but um, I'm happy to <laughs> right. do that. Yeah, that'd be fine. That'd be good. That way uh, we can stay, stay on target. I will, while I will, I will do that now. Go ahead. Proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so, uh, uh, but it would have been a good idea if I thought of having that ready on my computer, but I, I, I neglected to. So anyway, thank you, Bob. Uh, coming back, let me ask this question. Why is it that both the League of Nations and the United Nations have failed to create peace when the Council of Europe and the European Parliament, in the 70 years that it's existed, there hasn't been a single war by one member upon another member of the of the Council of Europe, there have been uh, civil wars. There have been wars outside that had refugees come in that implicated it. But the but the but they haven't uh, in a continent that was torn apart by war after war after war. And recently, this last summer, we went on a rotary exchange trip to Lithuania and went through the history. The history was just full of you know this group conquers this group and this group kills this group and this group conquers this group and just war after war after war for centuries, and it was stopped by the, 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 the Parliament of Europe. Uh, why has that been more successful than the UN and the League of Nations in helping to uh, prevent war among its members? Any comments or thoughts on that? Can I make a list real quick? First name? Nobody? Anybody? Oh, Saveda. Saveda. Stack. Gail, Saveda, Gail. Anyone else? And Ron. Ron has Ron? a comment. As well. Ron, Ron, do you have okay. a comment, really? So start okay. with that. Uh, first. Stack. Oh, I'm sorry? Yeah, Tom. Beach stack. Oh, I was wrong. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm not sure if Tom said he wanted something, but anyway, Saveda's first. Uh, yeah. Well, Tom H was saying that Tom put him Tom H in the stack after oh, Saveda and Gail. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> okay, Saveda's next. Okay, well, uh, a, a number of differences. First of all, the um, in the European Union, starting with Jean Monnet's vision, it started with the European Coal and Steel Community, nations, member nations of the European Coal and Steel Community, and later all the, the uh, communities that followed the European communities, and now the EU, were required to cede a certain modicum of their sovereignty 
to a higher authority, so to speak. This is not the case with the League of Nations or with the United Nations. The United Nations is really a forum in which people, nations come together to have consultations, but they haven't actually ceded any of their authority to the General Assembly to, to pass binding resolutions that are then enforceable. They, the resolutions are really in the form of recommendations. In the European Union, in the European model, let's put it that way, you actually have nations ceding a certain amount of their sovereignty in narrow spheres to a higher body that is supranational. It's not so much an inter, it's a hybrid. It's, it's, it's not a, a federation and it's not completely a loose association of states the way the United Nations is. It's somewhere in between where you have some elements of sovereignty that are ceded to higher authority. It's supranational as opposed to intergovernmental. This is something about which Jean Monnet spoke uh, a lot about. He was uh, actually very active in the League of Nations and was very disappointed that it failed. Uh, he had hoped that Europe would become a European federation, but recognized that the people of Europe were actually not ready for a federation. So he conceived of this idea of what's now become the European Union as a first step in what he hoped would be um, continuing links in the change of increasing integration that would lead to, to, to European federation. So I think that's one of the huge differences that we have between the United Nations model and, and, and the European Parliament model. Um, another fascinating aspect about, of the European, about the European Union, about which I wrote at length in my latest book published last year, Bridge to Global Governance, is that Jean Monnet built the European model on the basis of certain principles. He didn't articulate these principles openly, but if you go in and analyze how the system was built, it was built on, for instance, the principle of the oneness of nations. And you can see this manifest itself in many respects, including the way, for instance, the European uh, coal and steel community was funded. Uh, states were not to give contributions because he knew that that was one of the reasons for the downfall of the UN system, of the League of Nations system. Uh, that the more a state contributes towards an international organization, the more it feels that it ought to have a voice and have clout. So he said, forget about that. We're going to fund the system by taking a percentage of the um, proceeds of, from the production of coal and steel. That was an, an, an amazingly revolutionary thought that he had. The other was the way um, voting was done. It, there was no longer to be unanimity. There was going to be no power of veto. It was going to be done by majority voting. And on and on and on. There are a lot of examples of how certain principles like the principle of fairness and the principles of equity, uh, of oneness and the principle that the advantage of the part can only be guaranteed by guaranteeing the advantage of the whole. All of these um, really um, have made the European model a much more sophisticated model than the uh, UN. My final thought on this is that the the principles of federalism upon which the United States is built still represents really the highest form, if you like, of, of the principles that an organization like ours is aspiring to. Um, so uh, back to the point made that, you know, it's inconceivable to think that Nevada would, would want to uh, make war on a neighboring state or a state farther away. Once you have a unified system in which we all recognize that we're all limbs of one body, then you have something to start working with. Okay, I will stop there. That was, that was a superb answer. It looks like, sounds like you've got a, a terrific amount of information of value to us. It, to, can you tell us a little more, is your book already on the list of, of among those that we may be reading or discussing in the book club? Mm -hmm. And if not, can you tell us a little more about your book? Well, you've discussed one of my books in the book club, which was Building a World Federation, The Key to Resolving Our Global Crises. I wrote that in 2015. Um, but after that, I, I sat and thought and realized that the world may not be ready to make the leap from where we are to 
the concept of a world government as a whole. And I thought, well, what is a natural next step that might be politically palatable to the nations? And I thought the way to perhaps um, do this was to use the hook of saying, let's take the three most challenging global challenge, uh, challenges that we have internationally. One is climate change, as you mentioned. The second is nuclear proliferation that you also mentioned. And the third was the equitable distribution of energy because the, that is, in, is directly linked to climate change and nuclear proliferation. You can't solve either of those two without solving the problem of the equitable distribution of energy. And I decided to use the European model as an example and as a, as a, really as a roadmap and a model for how we could create a supranational institution to which nations would cede sovereignty in a very narrow area. In other words, taking Jean Monnet's model and replicating it on the international level uh, in a way that would solve uh, all concerns regarding nuclear proliferation, regarding climate change and equitable distribution of energy. Um, and one of the things I do in that is analyze um, uh, first of all, the qualities of leadership that are needed for this to happen. And secondly, the principles upon which such a model is based. Thirdly, the model itself and how it would work and how once we built such a model, it would create trust that such a thing is possible, that it is possible to, to tackle global challenges using a model of world government. And on that basis, then build out and expand the notion of, of the spheres in which a world government would, would operate. I thought that might be more politically palatable. It was published in 2018. It's called Bridge to Global Governance, and it has not yet been discussed um, in, in this book club. Mm. Well, thank you. Maybe, maybe the last uh, five or 10 minutes, we can talk a little bit more about other books that we feel are, are compelling to add to our future agenda. Um, but okay, we have Gail next. Is there more people waiting to talk? No? Yes, Gail. Well, um, yeah, what I was going to say is that I really don't know hardly anything about the Parliament of Europe and that um, I need to know uh, those things before I could answer Arthur's question. And so I'm very appreciative that Zoveda was able to provide a very good summary. Uh, I'm wondering whether, the, regarding the um, enforcement part of it, was there, I mean, did, has the Parliament of Europe then not encountered the problem of some members trying to break away or to do things in violation where there would be, um, well, um, the power of, um, you know, the sort of military power that would be threatened to enforce um, decisions or not? Uh, so interestingly, uh, so it, uh, we have to be careful in the comparisons of these models. So under the original model, the um, power vested not in the European Parliament, but rather in the Commission. And, you know, you have one of the big objections to the sovereignty within the EU and control, um, as demonstrated by the fact that Britain has now decided to depart, is that the European Commission has a lot of power. It has power to initiate legislation. It, it has the power to impose rules on countries that basically bypass national parliaments. That has always been the primary objection to the powers of the whole EU model. Um, the enforcement, the mechanism through which enforcement was achieved was a very clever one that, that Jean Monnet introduced. And that was to say that if either a nation or a corporation or an individual flouted the rules of the European coal and steel community it was at the time, the European coal and steel community would have by treaty the power to um, enforce, bring enforcement actions against those entities within the courts of the nations themselves. And that is what to me is just the stunningly amazing beauty of the European um, model is that nations deliberated this in their parliaments before they ratified the treaty, before they, if A, they signed on and B, ratified it. And they, here's how the conversations went. They said, well, how could we just give up our, I mean, we're the parliament of this country. How could we 
give such broad authority and right to this commission, this supranational organization, and allow it to make rules that bind our people without going through us, the parliament. And secondly, if these rules are flouted, how could we possibly then give them access to our judicial systems to enforce their rules against our own corporations and citizens? And yet they agreed to it. And the question is why? Well, they recognize that the benefits from ceding sovereignty in such a narrow sphere far exceeded um, the downside of, of, of ceding the sovereignty. In other words, they would stand to benefit more by integrating together and ceding a modicum of sovereignty than they would if they tried to go it alone. And indeed, all the economic and other analyses done 50 years later demonstrated empirically that indeed these nations who had joined together to participate um, in this project had benefited a lot more. And it brought peace to Europe. So uh, in, in, when we talk about enforcement, the way enforcement was envisioned under, under Monet's uh, vision and continues to today was not to have a military force, but to have these powers to use the judicial system. Now, the EU has progressed beyond that, and they recognize that in order to deal with threats in their own backyard, they do need a military force. And they've been talking about creating an EU rapid reaction force for several years now. And with the recent um, behavior of uh, Russia's aggression against in the Crimea and in Ukraine, uh, they are moving towards that by creating battalions that they've positioned in Estonia and the Baltic states. And they're hoping to build it out eventually to make it an EU rapid reaction force. Uh, so that's something that they will need to have. Uh, they've recognized that themselves. So it's a hole in the system. How did that apply to the breakup of Yugoslavia? Bob Stack. Oh, sorry. Um, well, Bob, well, Bob Stack, okay, we have Tom, but you want to reply to Soveda? So no, well, well, I just want to say that, that I, I would be all in favor of, you know, I mean, we, we need to plan our future. We're, 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 we're coming down the home stretch of this book, and I would be all in favor of looking at the European model, but I want to make sure we finish looking at Juncker's model uh, yeah. and, and, and his his materials. Um, so I, I'm so yes. Yeah, so I'm saying that we're, we're now brainstorming for future directions. But mm -hmm. I, 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 unless the, the book club wants to, I, I'd rather complete what we're doing now um, and then put this on as one of the things for next steps. Thank you. Yeah, I think oh. that's a good point. Uh, should uh, do we want to? Uh, uh, to let Bob now go through his list, or is there someone else who wants to continue with this? We have Terry, we have first Tom, and then yeah. you, Terry. First Tom wanted to say something. Tom Hastings. Oh, here he comes. Well, I'm Pat Viking in Tom's group here in Manhattan Beach. I just think this... We, oh, can you speak can a little you. Can you speak closer, closer uh, to the mic, please? Is this better? Yes, a uh, little bit. I'm, I'm Pat Viting in Tom Hastings' group. And I found this very fascinating, the idea of how do we, uh, what is it that makes the, the European model work? And I, I thought very informa interesting information on financing and enforcement that we just got. I suspect that one other factor is also the, the short term benefits, you know, I'm sure there are people who are interested in abstract things like climate change. I mean, most of us are really interested in that. But if there is an economic advantage to be had because you're now able to trade freely and if, if, there, if you get that unification of being able to cross borders once you're a state of, once you're a citizen of any state, you can live in any of these places, the common currency, I just wonder how much those things impact the cohesiveness and the feeling of one body. That's all. Great. Thank you, Pat. And um, so we had Terry. Terry was trying to interject. Yeah. Um, what uh, the uh, chapter four includes uh, the European notion throughout the Middle Ages and beyond of uh, this kind of ideological purity. Um, exemplified in, in the Crusades and uh, the Christian uh, assumption 
that uh, any anybody invading, uh, for instance, Spain, i.e. the Moors, uh, was to be shoved back. Um, and and uh, he makes the observation on page 71 that this crusading spirit of militant European Christianity has been pretty much extinct. Well, I would maintain um, a question that uh, asks, oh, who have the Euro-American um, coalition been at war with since World War II? One is, is Korea, the other is Vietnam. Now we're embroiled in the Middle East, which suggests to me a continuation and not an extinction of the European Christian spirit. I think uh, in general, the Euro-American uh, culture is at war with non-Euro-Americans and uh, with uh, a Zeta's list of, of three, I would add that uh, racism component to the problems facing a world uh, government. Thank you, Terry. And back to Arthur. Well, I, I was just thinking we should go back to uh, Bob is going to was going to put up on the screen and share with us some of the highlights from the chart. Uh, is that a good time to go with that? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, I, I, I have. I, oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. While, while you pull it up, Bob, can I make one comment about Chapter 4 that was new to me while you're pulling it up? Yeah, yeah, yeah um, absolutely. I, the, the, the new thing I had never heard of was the idea of um, weighted voting based on educational attainment. And I thought it was really, an, it's on page 60, it's writer's idea. And that was a new proposal to me. And I, I thought it was really interesting, especially in light of if the, if the rich nations can help the poor nations improve their education, that it just was an interesting concept worth, worth pondering. That's all, while I, Bob's pulling up your I, screen, but it I didn't thought, work. I thought by now you'd have your screen up, Bob. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, I'm ready to flip into it, but I didn't do that yet. Well, okay, I I'll do it, yeah. Too, uh, while he's calling it up. Um, and I think the idea of some combination of a, you know, kind of a meritocracy, uh, something where uh, everybody in the world has a right to be involved, but the more they, they study, the more they, they learn, the more they understand basic human rights and other things. Some system uh, using the tools of the internet where you're kind of bringing out, as Gary said in his talk, the highest and best wisdom of humanity rather than our current political system, which seems to lower things down to the lowest common denominator. People go for things much stupider than they really believe in because it's only, you know, we versus they, one wins or the other. Whereas a, a system, there could be other systems that raise us, raise to the top, the, uh, the best in each person. So uh, let's, but let's just believe that for future discussion and go to Bob if he's ready. Yeah, well, let, let me say that, that our discussion in, in, you know, when Arthur brought in Emery Reeves, we really, in my mind, um, gotten to the edge of the highlight of this chapter, uh, really, the, the high point, which is the, the Montreux Declaration, uh, you know, essentially establishing the World Federalist Movement as we know it today. Then the three proposals that came shortly after. And then, um, as, as Juncker says, the ideological barriers to World Federation. So before, so just handling them in that order, um, I wonder, Arthur, did you have anything to say about the Montreux Declaration? Because that really started. Oh, I think you just uh, you're, froze. You're, you froze up, Bob. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, you, you just hear me froze, now? Bob. You hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We heard so, your question about the mantra. We yes. heard that question. Yeah. So, Arthur, do you have anything on that? Because chronologically, that's the next thing. Well, yeah, no, I also found that uh, very interesting to note. Uh, I didn't have any uh, uh, special comment on it, but he did have, a, uh, you know, he did mention, uh, yeah, I, was, I was looking just now back at Ryder's proposal since it was just mentioned. And, uh, you know, he mentions that uh, uh, such individual, you know, they would both, it would both be, uh, he, he envisioned arms races replaced by education races as nations enthusiastically through their resources 
into educating their respective population. And I thought that was an interesting comment. But now going on to the Montrix, uh, I could, if I just, well, I could share my screen on it. Uh, he says uh, that the Declaration puts forth six essential characteristics of world government, and then he runs through them. He goes through, uh, but I thought we were going to do your share. I could, I'll share this a no, minute. I, I, I'm, I'm suggesting chronologically the Montreux Declaration kicked us off, and then I'll show the proposals that came after. Great. Okay. So can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. So as he mentions here in, in the in the Montreux Declaration, it put forth six essential characteristics of effective world government. They were universal membership, uh, and then moving on here, limitations of national sovereignty, as we just discussed on Europe, and transfer to the world federal government of such legislative, executive, judicial powers as relate to world affairs. And I think this, this touches on you, know, the, relating to those limited factors that affect everybody. Uh, three was enforcement of world law directly on the individual, whoever or wherever she may be. Now that is so important because this is both a guarantee of the rights of man and a suppression of all attempts against the security of federation. So in other words, I think that's really key. I think one of the key problems as has been pointed out with the UN and the league is that people don't feel a part of it. There's nothing that directly relates to them and nothing that directly, it, it, so, so it's both a two way street. It's what guarantees their liberty and what gives them a voice and a way to be involved. Uh, number four was creation of the supranational armed force capable of guaranteeing security. Now, uh, yeah, and disarming people down to internal policing. Well, you know, that's a really tough concept. And as you mentioned, even Europe's having trouble with that. Do we want to set up another military that has some independent control and that, that scares people? But the fact that then they've come up with new enforcement methods that may be even more powerful, sanctions don't seem to be very effective. They seem to just make people mad and worse. But there may be other things, as you mentioned, like in Europe, where there's certain economic advantages that, that, that pull people rather than push people. But that's a very interesting question. And then four, then five was ownership and control of the world federal government of atomic development. Uh, well, the, thing, the mass destruction. And that hasn't even been touched on since, but we do still have, uh, we still do have that nuclear uh, um, uh, sort of Damocles hanging over us, as, as President Kennedy said, and ready to be cut at any moment by accident, miscalculation, or madness. And that continues to be true, especially with the current administration. And then six was the power to raise adequate revenues directly. And as, as it was really interesting in the European model, they found a better way than direct taxation, but some way to raise adequate revenues that was independent of, uh, of the states having to uh, have the ones with more power controlling things. Uh, so, uh, Bob, did you have more comments on that, or do you want to move on well, to your... Well, all, yeah, all, all, all I wanted to say about that is, is many people are not aware of the fact that, that in 1947 in Montreux, Switzerland, a number of small world federalist groups and individuals from around the world got together, drafted those principles, and that essentially became the birthplace and the DNA of the movement as we know it today. You know, different proposals have, have you know, may have modified certain things or what have you, but that's, you know, if you want to point to a, a birthplace of the movement as we know it today, that's it. So um, I, I just wanted to highlight that because many people don't know that. So, so if there are any questions or whatever, again, I didn't prepare to make a presentation, but there may be some comments about that, then I'll put on the chart, unless there's anything on that first. I think go ahead with the chart. Okay, hearing none, let me uh, get to, sh let me do the screen share. Hold a moment. Uh, um, what happened? Oh, okay, hold on a second. I got to push a few more buttons okay. here. Um, while he's uh, while he's pushing okay. pushing the button, uh, I, I I I do think that that's important to understand that history and that the key role that Declaration paid, played and how it's still in many ways vibrant today. Um, Bob, we're ready to go here in a moment. Yeah, I'm still trying to get the right things out of the way here. Okay, okay, good. All right, like I got it. Okay, so. Oh, All she's right. muted. Yeah, you're muted. Oh, now here, Bob. Here, Bob. Ready to go. Okay. Roll okay. It. All right. Like I said, I did not prepare to do a presentation, so I'm not going to make one, but I will point out what I shared with everybody, 
Uh, first, can you see the screen? You, yes. you see the chart? Okay. Yes. So, so um, I, I sent to Gail, who forwarded to hopefully everybody here, uh, got it, these two charts. So you're looking at the first one. I've made it as big as I can on my screen, so I don't know. Hopefully you can see it. So these are the, uh, well, first, this chart is taken from an earlier book of Juncker um, called uh, Rethinking World Government. And he takes these three proposals that he talks about in, in our book on the, the idea of world government, and he lays them out in these uh, schematic charts, which makes it very easy to look at them and compare. So the first one is by, pardon my um, you know, lack of Italian pronunciation, uh, Giuseppe uh, Borghese, and, um, and this is called the Federal Republic of the World. Um, and he has a world constitution. And as you see, it's broken down what the legislature would look like, the executive branch, et cetera, et cetera. So that's number one. Then the second proposal is by Clark and Son. And, and this is probably one of the better known ones in U.S. history that, that, that came out of, you know, think, thought here. It was published by Harvard. Um, and it basically took the U.N. and amended it in certain ways, expanded the charter, um, and that, uh, and world peace through world law was the title, which was the slogan of the world federalist movement uh, when it got born. So that's the second model. Then the third model is the only one that people are actually, there, there is a group of people currently working on this still. It was founded by Philip Isley. Uh, my understanding is that Philip um, had a vitamin company and got enormously wealthy uh, from selling vitamins and he bankrolled uh, this effort to create what got to be known as the Earth Constitution, or the Federation of the Earth, I should say, based on the Earth Constitution. Um, there is an organization now called the World Constitution and <coughs> Parliament Association. Uh, there's a fellow named Glenn Martin who has taken it over from Philip Isley, and they have drafted probably the most comprehensive um, const, you know, proposed constitution for the earth. And they go around the world, they have, um, you know, they, they're having meetings and, and uh, I forgot what they call it, but they're kind of mock up, as a, you know, they're passing world laws and things like that. And their strategy is to shop it around the different nations of the world um, to get them to buy in, to adopt the constitution. So that's, um, so that's that group. And then Juncker also has his own proposal, which we go into in the next chapter. Um, so I won't say anything about it now, but that's also in the charts. So those, um, that's what I sent out. So you can peruse that um, you know, at, at your convenience. And if there are any though questions or comments of what people saw uh, when they looked at those, if you had a chance to, they just went out, uh, we can certainly have that discussion. And yeah. then the final thing in the chapter is the ideological barriers to it. So I'll, I'll, I'll pause right now, but then again, I'll make a comment about that last part. Uh, but if there's anything, any comments yeah. about these models, um, you know, we can have that discussion. Thank, thank you very much, Bob, for sharing that. I remember how excited I was when I was in high school and when the Clark and Sewin book came out and to read that and to, uh, and to to to, uh, <laughs> to see the comprehensive ideas for how this could work. Uh, my mom had attended the uh, University of Illinois. She and my aunt were one of the first uh, women uh, to attend, and they were involved with the world government movement. Even wrote a paper on the subject of, of world government. So uh, so I discovered you know I discovered this book uh, when it first came out in high school and was very moved by it. And I also think that what Glenn Martin and Isley and, and, I, and, I, 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 and so on were doing with the Earth Constitution, I was kind of flabbergasted when I read it to see how detailed it was, what a, what a good, uh, good proposal it was, a lot of good workable things. Uh, of course, the whole question is how we actually, you know, get it popularized. And to me, uh, you know, somehow we need to get all this incorporated in a, in a major motion picture that gives people that vision, just as Star Trek did in a cursory way, but something more in depth. Uh, but again, uh, thank you for sharing that. Other other comments on what Bob just shared? I have a. Uh, uh, and did you try to stop the screen sharing? Yeah, there's Bob, someone trying to get, get in. Yes, I'll, I'll stop sharing. Let me. Uh, yeah, there's to... a little, uh, little 
I'm yeah, sometimes the, the button is there. Okay, okay, stop share. Yeah, okay. okay. There we go. <laughs> right, I, have a, I have a question for Bob or anybody. Um, the, the NATO funding model for a uh, military force seems to be 2% of the GDP of the individual action, uh, nations within NATO. Uh, is that been considered um, a kind of, you know, a federation of states vis-a-vis -vis the military? Um, could, I, I'm not clear what, what the question is. I heard the words. I'm not clear what you're asking. Okay. The, the, the NATO model for setting up uh, an enforcement force seems to be a coalition of national militaries mm -hmm. based on 2% of their GDPs. Yeah. Has that been picked up by any of the proposals that, that you summarized, Bob? Oh, oh, you mean just the funding piece? That's what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, and the organizational piece. These are our national militias uh, committed to the NATO purpose. Yeah. Well, what, what, there's a group, and I think it's centered in Australia. Chris Hamer uh, is the uh, he he he's kind of the lead, he's a, a, you know a, a part of the World Federalist Movement, and he's been pushing that NATO essentially get elevated to being the world military, that it get repurposed essentially. Or no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm saying that wrong. That that the that that, that the NATO countries, I'm sorry, the countries in NATO and the OECD, I believe, that those form the core of the democratic nations that become the World Federation. He's working from that angle. Um, and th those are, are the core democracies that, that he is suggesting um, and his group be put together uh, to form this. But as far, I don't know if that percent of GDP is in any of those three proposals. I don't remember seeing that there. There are a number of proposals out there for how to fund this. And you know, you heard Juncker mention one, um, but I can't answer that question about these three models. I'm not an expert on those three models. Yeah, I am hoping, I've mentioned this to Gail, I'm hoping that over the course of this book club, we get a chance to read those books so we can see the thinking and the models over the next, you know, course of time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'd like to, uh, uh, since I noticed we only have 10 more, about 10 more minutes uh, and then to have some general discussion, to just run through uh, a couple more things in this chapter. Um, I thought this was very interesting. He said uh, on the extreme version, but I thought it was really key. Uh, it might be necessary for the people to circ circumvent national governments entirely and hold a world constitutional convention to establish a world government without, you know, waiting for the national governments to participate. And um, to me, I think that's a, a really uh, key concept, especially when we see how after 70 years, we haven't gotten the nation states to really, really act. And there are new tools to do that. I mean, he mentions that, uh, he mentions that there was, that, that when they did have a people's world convention, uh, in 1950, it got stymied. There were 500 people, but there, nobody agreed on things, and they they couldn't get together any better than the uh, than the than the nation states did. Uh, they did uh, uh, they didn't adopt the world con constitution. They couldn't agree on when and where to hold future conventions, <laughs> or or anything. So it didn't 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 quite work. But uh, to me, I think the key question is now with the new tools of the internet whether there may be some more bottom-up ways that you can have small groups interact in ways that really have the power to uh, break through. We see where we can get, uh, you know, red states, green, red states, blue states, uh, Palestinians and Israelis in these key groups where people start using certain methods of, 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 uh, uh, of finding what are our commonalities, how do we reach common ground, and some incredible successes when you, when you look at places where people have applied these models of revolutionary conversations and so many other, getting the yes, so many other approaches. And you know, this, so it made me think about Gary's model of, of, of a range of small groups that interact into a bigger group that do find the 
uh, the will of the people, which is really the key. That's what the institution, the, the Declaration of Independence says, and the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that is right of the, the right of the people to institute government, and that the will of the people is the basis of government. So then uh, also well, running through had, his- I think, uh, uh, I think Bob wanted to interject something. Well, yeah. I, I just wanted to um, say that what, what Arthur is talking about right now is how Isley sent plan to do it. That in the Isley model, they felt the UN was so hopelessly broken that they would have to work outside. Maybe some parts of it could be salvaged, like the World Health Organization or whatever. So they've been doing their meetings um, around the world in various places, trying to build the world constitution and have countries join them uh, all outside of the UN structure. So that's exactly what he was advocating. Thank you. Right, and I think that's what's mentioned here on this page where he yeah. does mention, uh, uh, he does mention again, Isley's uh, concept and uh, the, uh, these, these three different proposals. And he talks about uh, Robert Hutchins and his book, Foundations of the World Republic, uh, published by the uh, University of, of Chicago. Uh, so I think that fits right in. And it does talk here be, uh, a little more about that uh, uh, World Parliamentary Association headquartered in Colorado and uh, th how they've continued to do just what you said, ratified some initial conventions and moved among different people and are beginning to have the groundwork for doing this. And people like Linus Pauling were involved and others uh, and Desmond Tutu and other well-known figures uh, so I think that is a very important seed of uh, some of the change we, we need in this era where uh, actually the, the need for some kind of governmental structure is, is becoming more and more clear to people as climate change threatens our very uh, survival. Um, of course, the, the, he also mentions the dangers we have to deal with, how do we prevent the tyranny of the majority? Um, and let me see what other highlights I had in this chapter. There's lot, lots of, of, of interesting things in it. Uh, the, the danger, the, the, you know, the, the, the possibility of destruction by nuclear became no more some, something no more in the distant future, but very, very real. Uh, and the fear and anxiety uh, of nuclear war took a psychic strain rather than causing people to come together into world governance. It also, among the casualties was any sort of rational thinking about world government, fear and anxiety, ruled out any degree of mental flexibility and imagination with respect to the concept. So in the whole Cold War era, I thought it was an interesting discussion of, of, uh, of why things broke down and didn't happen and lessons for how we can move forward. You know, people were fearful, as we mentioned, of a total, uh, total uh, uh, power, all-powerful state, and we've dealt with that already. Um, let's see. Just as non-communist analysts were leery of world government on the ground, so that it might be transformed into a tool of communist expansion, so the communists were equally scared it would go the other way around. That also was something Gary Davis commented on, where they, they the Soviets accused him of exporting world government along with powdered eggs and uh, the sector novel. Anyway, I just wanted to briefly run through that and then unshare my screen. Uh, just some of the highlights that I thought were particularly relevant to uh, to our discussion today. And I think the discussion has been really rich. I'm really enjoying yeah. everybody's comments. So let me throw it back to uh, uh, the comments and questions. And now we have another uh, six minutes left uh, before the end of the hour. So um, let's make, open it up. Yeah. David uh, Stack. Okay. okay, David. Oh. Um, <clears throat> on the section in chapter five about the ideological barrier to world government, I can share a footnote from my dissertation. Um, one of the main proponents against world government uh, that many people might recognize that, uh, his name was Reinhold Niebuhr. He was a very famous uh, Protestant theologian and thought that there was no way that there could ever be a world government as long as there was uh, such a divide between the communist world and the capitalist world. And he thought that that conflict would pretty much continue on indefinitely. And of course, he didn't foresee the collapse of the Soviet Union in uh, the late 20th century, and how uh, there certainly was a possibility to try and get people uh, joined together. Um, the subject of my dissertation was uh, a philosopher 
who disagreed with Niebuhr, uh, both theologically and politically, and that was Henry Nelson Wyman. And Wyman uh, thought that certainly we could get a world um, federation in existence if uh, people were committed to what he called creative interchange, of trying to understand things on a much broader international world level. And um, so I certainly uh, like Pope to agree with the optimism of Wyman and against the pessimism of uh, uh, Niebuhr, but certainly that's part of the uh, ongoing debate still to this day. Uh, right. Although the new I ideology is uh, nationalism and this whole idea we have in our country today about, about America first. Yeah. So uh, those are the kind of ideologies that certainly are going to um, prevent us from furthering the idea of a world federation. I think we should go to Barat because he hasn't spoken yet and he had wanted to speak. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm reminded of uh, the philosopher uh, who said, when you have a complex question, a series of questions to deal with, the solution to the problem is the removing of the problem and not so much beating your head to solve the problems. And in the to me, the idea of world government is just fraught with so many, many problems at the level of the intellectual and the mind and systems and so on. I'd like to approach this with the idea and in some way, the sustainable development goals provides a model for it. In my personal experience, uh, I'm a physicist, I did not know much about medical issues, nor did I know much about uh, issues related to uh, indigenous people and so on. But in the last four or five years, I've been involved in trying to end childhood malnutrition and improve maternal health. Mm -hmm. And I have learned so much in that I have developed through my heart a connection to the you know, the poorest out in the indigenous people. And now we are involved. We have developed using technology spoken tutorials and with the propagation of iPhones, I mean, smartphones, we now have spoken tutorials in an open source, which deals with the entire issue of the first 1000 days of mother and child. In, in terms, and that is the model for avoiding, and just last week, we converted those spoken tutorials into Spanish, and we're gonna do it in indigenous languages. And that way we are connecting to the world, and we are finding the feedbacks that people give, how connected they feel with each other. Similarly, we can develop models for the climate change issues that are affecting Australians, Californians, uh, you know, other issues. If we can work and their partnerships involves everybody in the world. You know, idea of ideology doesn't come in and we all are kind of at the same level working together. And I feel as we move towards this making a better world, uh, somehow through osmosis, the notion will come, hey, we are all one. You know, we, we have to make this world and one, and out of that, perhaps we can come up with an organization. And that's when perhaps ideas that we are being talked about now could be dug out as treasures and the good parts of it taken and form a sort of a perfect union, you know, to the extent possible. That's I, I love what Marat is saying. I think that's so important. And I think there really is an incredible grassroots resurgence in so many areas where, where people are solving things. I, I happen to be a member of Rotary. And we have a Rotary, an incredible Rotary Peace Conference coming up in just a few days in Ontario, California on the 17th and 18th. Uh, that's pretty near Los Angeles if anybody wants to, to, to go to uh, uh, Peace Conference, Rotary Peace Conference 20, 
2020, you'll see it. Um, and uh, all over the world, people are doing the kinds of things you're doing, solving problems at local levels. And when we can get all the people solving all these problems interactively in their local level and groups, interacting in such a way that that comes together and coalesces into a new form of world governance that is self-enforcing from the bottom up where, you know, where people are, are, are scanning products in their store and not buying one from world law violators and where they're not applying for jobs with world law violators. And when we build this kind of bottom up movement of, of solutionaries, I think that's a, a key hope. I noticed we are at the top of the hour. I think we're supposed to go till 1030. Um, I'm fine to see if some people want to, but I think it's about time we need to close the formal meeting and just say anybody who wants to carry on can can keep talking. Uh, any, Gail, what do you say about that? Yes, I want to mention that the next meeting we, are, we have is scheduled for Saturday, February 8th, which is the second Saturday of February. That's the, the kind of the schedule is to meet the second Saturday of each month at the same time, that would be noon to 1.30 Eastern time. And as we mentioned at the beginning, Dave Otten and Ron Glossop will be leading discussion on the last two chapters of the Yunker book. Dave is gonna take chapter five and Ron chapter six, as I understand. So make sure that's on your that's, calendar. That's exactly right. And thank you, thank Arthur you very and Melanie. Much for a very uh, stimulating and I think um, informative, uh, informative session and stimulating discussion. Thank you, everyone. Oh, well, thank, thank you. you everyone. Thanks. Really, session is adjourned. <laughs> thank you all. Arden, thank you. Especially. Bye bye. It was bye -bye. a very good meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much.